topic of entry and exit routes gets very little ink in the media, whether it be written or on TV or in YouTube videos, yet it's an extremely critical aspect of hunting successfully, especially in heavily pressured areas. I put out a video that uh, showed head headlamps, you know, different lumen headlamps and how, how bright they were in comparison to, you know, like AAA or even a AA uh, flashlight where you're looking at, you know, 30 to maybe 70, 80 lumens on a light's what I kind of look for. Um, just keep it on the ground and find your tacks or reflective markers with it. That's all I need it for. And many, many times I've had guys come in with headlamps that I could see from a far distance on public land and had deer run by me well before daylight. Uh, if they spook deer, they don't even know it. That makes a big difference because that does spook deer. I don't care what anybody says on any TV show or any YouTube channel. They spook deer. I've seen it many, many times. I have three different flashlights I use, that was one of them. That's a 400 lumen headlamp. All you need for an entry is enough to see the ground and your next tack in front of you. That's all you need. The lower impact you have on an entry, the less chance you're gonna have of spooking deer, the better odds you're gonna have of killing a deer. Because you may spook the deer you're trying to actually kill. So having these bright lights, and then once you get to the tree, you know, you're going up the tree, your head's turning, or your head's moving all the time, you're raising your head up, looking where the steps or the sticks are, whatever, climbing into your stand. Now you're way up, you're up 20, you know, 18 to 25 feet. And now that light can be seen from a seriously long distance and people still use them. I, I don't get it. If you're going through heavy cover, or even if you're going through open timber in the dark, whether it be an entry or an exit, you need to mark your routes very well. It's very important not to get overly excited on an entry because you lose your route, and that's what happens. If you lose track of your entry route, you will get anxiety and it will make you perspire more. Yeah, Onyx works to an extent, but you can't follow, unless it's down a runway or something, you can't follow an Onyx track mark, trail mark very well through brush. You just can't because it's not that accurate. If it's five feet off, that's enough to lose your, your route when you're going through you know, heavy cover. And usually when you mark a trail through heavy cover on an onyx, you're marking it in the daytime. So you're marking it when you can see stuff in front of you and you avoid it. When you're coming in in the dark and you're trying to follow a trail and you get off tr track as little as seven, eight, ten feet, you can't see that stuff in front of you for a landmark to say, okay, I got to go to the side of this. You're just following it through the brush and it's very easy to get off course. And yeah, obviously you'll end up at your destination location, but it might take you longer and you may make more noise doing it because you're off your trail. Usually your trails are the quietest entry to that, even though it's through brush. You know, I, I mark every one of my locations on Onyx. And I do carry my phone, not for texting or any of that stuff. I never, ever look at my phone when I'm on stand, ever. I've talked to so many guys that have missed opportunities because they're texting or playing a game. Enjoy nature, enjoy what's going on. Um, but anyway, I mark all my routes, so obviously I'm gonna end up at the route no matter what if I have it marked on Onyx, but it's much easier and you're in a very direct line when you use trail markers. So I definitely suggest that. And I also suggest using white ones on private and brown ones, which is HME or brown reflective uh, clip-ons, you know, if you're on public, so other hunters can't see your markers in the daytime. Out here in the rain, just a nice killing light rain. Also kind of sucks. I've had 15 cameras out for 10 days. I haven't gotten one photo of a buck I would kill 
115 is probably the biggest. As you can see right here, there's a white tack in this front tree. That's what I use most of the time, and I literally have several thousand of those. I buy those by the case. There's usually 50 in a box and 12 boxes to a case. I probably tacked 500 to 1,000 routes between a quarter to a mile and a half long through brush, because usually if you're walking through open areas, check that out. I'm in my lake association, so I'm standing here in the middle of the day in the rain, and the deer are moving right now. It's midday, and there he goes. And you could hear cars go by. I uh, can't hunt here, just so none of you people get the wrong idea. There's no hunting in this area whatsoever. Uh, houses are too close together. I'm actually in my neighbor's yard. That's a white tack, and you can see that relatively easy on a daytime entry. So if you're hunting public land, or when I'm hunting public land, I never use white tacks. I always use greens, which, but they also, HME makes a brown tack. And if you see that tree right there, someplace in that damn tree. Oh, there it is. There's a brown tack. Now, you can't see that in the daytime very well, obviously, because when I'm back in this camera, that white tack is obvious as could be. You can't see that brown tack. So, brown tacks from HME for public land are the best to use because you can't see them in the daylight, so no other hunters are going to follow your tacks to your spot. Uh, and they do reflect pretty pretty decent at night. They don't reflect as far as a white, but they do reflect pretty well. Right there is a white with an orange tack. So anytime I want to make a turn, even if I'm using a brown or a green tack, I will put an orange tack to the side. Now that one there dictates a 45 degree. Once I get to the white tack, I've got to turn and go 45 degrees forward and a little bit to the left, a 45 degree angle, because I've got that orange tack 45 degrees above the left side of that tack. Again, a clip on reflective marker, and we have a bread tie style white reflective marker. Those are very obvious to see in the daylight. So when you're using those, expect, if you're on public land, expect company. Company is gonna follow your markers to see where the hell you're hunting. On that same tree, about eight inches below the orange and to the right side is a brown clip-on reflective marker, exactly the same size as the orange one. But it's very difficult to see in the daylight and it reflects extremely well at night. But there's that brown reflective marker. This right here is a prime example of how far you can see a white tack. I'm yeah, 15, 17 yards probably, and I can see that white tack with no problem in the daylight. There's also a green tack and there's also a brown tack in that same tree within a few inches of the white one. You cannot see them right now. I'm gonna zoom in. Okay, there you can see the green one up above the white one. At least I can from the camera side. And the one made by HME down below the white one you can barely see it now, and I've zoomed in on that quite a bit. So the green one's above it about 10 inches, and the brown one's below it about 10 inches. And right about now, zoomed in like that, I can see the green one, I can see the white one. I can barely see that, because I know the brown one's there, I can see it. If I didn't know it was there, I would not be able to see that brown tag. But when you're just walking through the woods like this, that white, those brown and green tags, you cannot see those. So make sure if you're using brown tacks or if you have access to some old Maristep green tacks um, that you know the reflective distance so you know how far to place them and the white tacks as well or reflective, any kind of reflective marker. Know the distance and make sure if you're putting them out during post season, make sure when you put them out that you're going to clean off all, the, all of the vegetation that could possibly grow in front of them. Uh, during the summer and block them from your visual when you're using your light for your entries or exits. Hey, I showed these tacks earlier today in the daytime and how hard they were to see. So now I'm going to show them. I'm probably 15 yards and I'm going to show them with my little two AAA flashlight. So you can see how bright that white one is. It's much brighter than the others, the white tack at the bottom. Then just above it, there's a brown tack which is almost impossible to see in the tree in the daytime, so other people can't follow it. But at about 15 yards, I can still see that reflection with my little tiny AAA flashlight. 
Above that is an orange tack. And then above that's the green tack, which was also hard to see. The orange one and the white one are easy to see in the daytime. And at night, they don't reflect as far. To the left is that clip-on brown reflective strip, and you can see that really well. Above that is the orange clip-on reflective strip made by the same company. One's brown, one's orange. You can see the orange one in the daytime. That brown one, you can't even see it in the daytime. And then there's flagging tape. Obviously, flagging tape doesn't reflect. And then over on that right side are the reflective bread ties. It's very common for me on a hunting location to have a different entry route than an exit route. Because anytime you're entering, let's say you're entering an evening location, I'm gonna go through the most open area that I can until I have to actually cut into the dense security cover of where I'm going to be hunting. Because the more open area I go through in the daytime, there's less chance of deer being in that area, so there's less chance of me spooking deer. That's why when I'm going, if I'm hunting in a timber and it borders the edge of a CRP field or a crop field, a short crop field, or even a standing corn field, I always walk through the middle of the field if it's an open field with short crops or it's a CRP. But if it's standing corn, I'll go about 10, 12 rows into the corn and walk the corn until I can see the trees because from that distance, you can still see the trees off to the side. And then once I see the area where I need to cut in, then I cut over through the, those 10 or 12 rows to the edge and then I go straight in from that. That way I'm not spooking deer down the edge of the timber line that may be bedded there. Even though they may be peripheral deer that I have no intention of killing, they're still going to spook other deer or make other deer that are back in the bedding area where they are deeper not come in that direction until after dark, especially your mature buck. Mature bucks are smart in pressured areas. They just don't do stupid things because they've been through a couple of seasons, the ones I want to kill anyway and they've usually been wounded or they've been shot at. You hear the traffic in the background behind me. And I'm entering through the middle of this field. Got a marsh to that side, cattails, water. I don't know if you can see the water over there, but there's water back in there. Deer could bed anywhere on that edge. And on this side over here, we've got the same thing. We've got timber dropping down into a river. There's a river over that, so there's a lot of security cover between that timber and probably 40 yard stretch to the river. And deer can bed there as well. Because if they get spooked, they can run across that river. It's really shallow. This spot back here is evening only. So on evening hunts, I walk through the middle of this field so as not to spook deer bedded on the edges, which could spook and spook other deer farther back in that I might want to have a shot at that, that night. So even if I'm spooking deer I don't want to shoot, they could potentially spook deer as they're running back away from me, back deeper into the bedding area. Opportunities are way too skinny to spook anything with entries. Obviously you do now and then, but you want to make it as the least possibility as possible and not walking down the edges of timber where there's security cover they could bet in it is not cool. Walking through the middle of the field where you know deer are not going to be is the way to go. For all of your milkweed fans, these are milkweed. A lot of them on this property. Yeah, it works. Shows you which way the wind's gonna blow, so it tells you where the deer are gonna be when they blow and wind you. I don't know why you just don't use technology and not have to worry about paying attention to wind. But each their own. It's so much easier to walk an edge, but you don't want to always take the easy way out. You want to take the smart way out. And the smart way, so you're not spooking deer bedded possibly along this edge, is to turn and go into the actual corn. Two, three, nine, ten, eleven. Go in 10 and 12 rows. So now you've got your edges over here and you're in the corn, not spooking anything along that edge. Your odds of spooking something in the corn when you're only a few rows in is very, very small. They usually don't bed in the head rows. They bed out towards the center of the field farther. 
Pressure bucks are smart in pressured areas. They just don't do stupid things because they've been through a couple of seasons, the ones I want to kill anyway, and they've usually been wounded or they've been shot at. And many of them have actually carried several wounds, some up to four. I've found four projectiles in one deer before and three in another. So on an evening hunt, I'll go through those open areas and then cut into my tree. And then when I exit, I usually wait 20 minutes to a half an hour after dark to get out of my tree. And then I exit through the timber because I know if I go back out the same way I came in, if it's a short crop field or even a CRP field, I'm going to be spooking deer that are out there. You know, I wait until 20, 30 minutes after dark so all the deer have left the timber and they're into the crops or ag or whatever it may be. They're out of the bedding area and that's when I do my exit. And I try to exit and I have a, mark, a route marked with tacks through the bedding area so I'm not spooking deer because they're up and they're already gone. On a morning hunt, it's just the opposite. I'm going to enter through the bedding area on my marked route and then I'm going to leave and go out through the open area where the deer are not in anymore. The deer are back in the bedding area, so I'm gonna make a straight beeline out of the bedding area. Typically, if I'm hunting in a bedding area, it's gonna be an all day sit. It's usually during pre-rut, main rut, or post-rut. And the amount of hunting pressure in the area that you're hunting should affect your forethought on your entry and exit routes for difference. The object is always to plan your route through the areas you're going to have the least possibility of spooking deer. Sure, do I spook deer with entries and exits on occasion? Absolutely, there's no way you can't. Um, Michigan has lots of deer. So if anybody wants to come and just kill a deer or even a year and a half and possibly a two and a half year old buck, Michigan's a great state. But if you're coming, if you're going someplace and you want to kill a three or a four year old buck, you don't want to come here. You just don't want to come here. Uh, it's just way too difficult. There's so far and few between. Every location you should think about, okay, the seasonal, as well as the daily timing that location is for. You know, obviously when you're hunting oaks, you know, they're for early season hunting because they're dropping food. Usually by the time rut phases get around, the, the acorns are pretty well mopped up. So, you know, that's an early season location. And whenever you're hunting, you know, natural feeding locations like apples or, or uh, acorns or chestnuts or something like that, or, um, briar leaf patches um, you know those if they're a destination feeding location and there's not a lot of other preferred food in the area so that's their preferred food sources on mornings you're gonna spook those deer with your entries they're gonna be feeding at them so there's no sense hunting them in the mornings there's been times I've went out of state and there's areas even in Michigan where I, I don't hunt mornings I just don't hunt morning because all I'm gonna do is spook deer it's just gonna ruin the location so you know, certain areas are morning locations, certain areas are evening locations. Uh, obviously, those mast and fruit destination areas during early season, they're evening locations. So I'm not spooking deer with my entries because they're not there feeding yet. They're going to come in in the evening before dark and feed. You know, when I'm hunting interiors of swamps, I usually save those for the rut phases. And those are all day sets. I go in way before daylight, an hour and a half, two hours before daylight. I'm in my tree so that I don't spook deer with my entry because those bucks are going to be moving into transitioning into those bedding areas well before daylight you know half hour 45 minutes an hour before daylight I've got to be in my tree and settled in so I'm not spooking them with my entry and then obviously if I got down and left during the daytime I'd spook something likely with my exit because there's going to be a, other deer bedded in there does and fawns and you know I'm not a big believer in buck only bedding area if there's a small bedding area yeah and there's a buck bedding in it it could be a buck bedding area uh, because it's so small. But if you're in a big bedding area, you're going to have does and bucks bedded in it. I don't care what anybody says. That's BS. I've seen it a thousand, thousand, thousand times. Um, so there is no designated buck bedding area unless, it, unless it's really small. And obviously, if a buck's bedded in a small bedding area, does don't want anything to do with them. So they're going to avoid it and bed someplace else. But in large bedding areas and swamps, there's going to be does as well as bucks bedding in it. Another good thing about evening entries is during the evening, deer in general are more confined. They're back in the security cover bedded. Whereas on morning entries, you know, deer could be anywhere. They're gonna be scattered at night because they just meander and browse and uh, browse through timber. They're out in the crop fields. They're pretty much everywhere. So you're more apt to spook deer with morning entries than you are with evening entries. Entries play a huge part in success so 
on evening entries if you can walk through open areas where you know deer are not going to be and not walk edges where you could potentially spook deer that's the plan on morning entries it's just the opposite if you know deer are out in open areas short crop fields and stuff then you want to enter through the timber down a marked lane with tacks so you're getting in to the timber before the deer come in and you're not spooking them with your entry vice versa for evening exits once you enter through this you don't want to come back out with your exit through this there could potentially be deer out here chewing their cuds or feeding on the grasses so you want to exit through the timber where the deer came from and that have left that's why I typically exit about a half an hour after dark after the most of the deer have left left the timber if I'm in an ag area and they're out into the crops and then I exit through the timber after dark same deal mornings you enter through the timber before daylight and then you exit through the crop fields short crop fields or CRP fields with, with your exit you know after the morning hunt so you're not spooking deer you have the least amount of chance of spooking deer with your entries and exits as you can see this tree here is loaded with acorns but I am not going to walk down this lane 99% of everybody I know would walk down this lane right here. The way I'm going to come into this is I'm going to walk about 12 rows out into that corn where my noise will not affect anything if it's bedded along the edge of this lane because this is thick enough where deer can bed anywhere down in here. And I'm not worried about just spooking the deer I want to kill. I'm worried about spooking any deer that could potentially run and spook deer and keep them from coming out in the evening because this is an evening only location because it's a food source so if I come in here on a morning there's an excellent chance I'll spook the very animal I'm trying to kill because he's feeding under these trees so this is an evening only location and I will enter it through the corn and I'm sure I'll get some arguments about that but I would guarantee 99% of all hunters TV anybody would walk down this lane because you know why because it's easier to get your highest opportunities you got to take entries where you're going to have the least amount of impact on the location you're going to hunt for the rest of the season not just for that particular hunt and walking 12 rows out into that corn is the way to do it because head rows on a cornfield are always going parallel to the to its edge a lot of the locations i've hunted i have to enter them with hip boots or waders especially on public lands that's that's one of my rules if i'm hunting public land in michigan it's extremely rare when I'm going without having to enter the area with hip boots or waders, crossing rivers, or using a canoe to cross a lake to separate myself from 98% of the other hunters in the area. You've got to go back to where they have pushed those deer. Even in early season, uh, you know, there's so much preseason scouting and location, preseason location preparation on public lands in Michigan that any mature buck, as soon as all that activity starts to take place, they know the gig and they move back into the heavy security cover on public lands, especially. So you gotta you gotta don waders or hip boots or use a canoe or whatever you have to do to get back into those areas where other hunters just are not willing to put the work effort to go back to. And that's exactly where the deer are. That's where the deer are pushed. That's where you have to go. And here's my marker. So when I'm coming in in the evening. For an evening hunt across the river because my tree is right on the other side of the river it's 15 yards off the edge of the water so i'm not going to be intruding into the bedding area for an evening sit i'm going to be sitting in a spot where deer come out of the bedding area have a major shallow crossing right there which is a river funnel and they're going to come into the standing corn so they got cover to cover or they're going to go up and eat on those acorns so i've got this this tree marked with tacks this is the area where i actually will come down in my waders or hip boots and what I'll do is I'll cross that river back there and then I will take off the hip boots or waders and put on my hunting boots and I'm literally going to roll them up put them in a black plastic bag hide them under a stump and walk 15 yards max to the tree I'm going to hunt and I'm going to hunt and because the waders are in a plastic bag they're not going to have any scent to them
sometimes when I'm having to cross a cornfield I, and I have to walk perpendicular to the rows, I will actually bend the corn stalks over 45 degrees so they don't lose the corn, but it creates a walkway for me from wherever I park to get to my hunting location. And here's a visual of that. Requires quite a lot of time, but again, it's all about getting potential opportunities. And the quiet you, quieter you can walk through in the middle of a cornfield, uh, the better chance you have of not spooking deer bedded within it. This is what you do when you have to make an entry route through corn perpendicularly to the corn as opposed to down the rows. That tree right there, it's a big red oak. It's a tree I hunt. In the years that tree has acorns, and this is in standing corn, what I'll do is I'll actually make a walkway through the corn because to walk through the corn, I have to go perpendicular to the rows. They go the opposite direction. I put my foot on a stalk on each side, right and left, and I push it down till it's about 45 degrees. I don't want the farmer to lose his corn, so I knock the corn over 45 degrees, and I get the farmer's permission to do this. You can see all those corn stalks are angled. And that way I can walk through this corn very quiet, as I'm doing right now. In fact, my pants rubbing together are making more noise than walking on the ground. So this is a very quiet entry for an evening hunt without spooking deer that are bedded in the corn with my entry, because deer will definitely be bedded in the corn. And these routes are made at the same time or prior to me doing my speed tours. So I do not do these during season. Once I decide I'm gonna hunt a tree, which is based on what I see during my speed tours or cameras that I put out in earlier September, uh, if I know I'm gonna hunt that tree, then I will do this to the corn. It's pretty rare that I have to do this. Once in a while, however, I have to. And this is really important, and I can't say this enough. Scent control is a big deal. You see very, very few TV actors. I call them actors because I don't think they're much hunters because of where they hunt. They hunt in zoo-like settings. I just watched a video last night. I could only watch it for like 30 seconds because there had to be 50 deer out in this picked cornfield. If that's not a zoo, there had to be 15 bucks out there. And the guy couldn't decide on which big buck he wanted to shoot. That is out of reality. That is not hunting. That is deer farming. I don't care what anybody says. Ultra management is deer farming. You are farming and growing deer until you get one big enough to shoot. It has nothing to do with hunting skill whatsoever. Um, kind of makes me sick. Following tax. See that tack? Another tack. There's another tack. And of course, anytime you make an entry or exit route, it's usually going to be down some form of a runway. And when you have confidence in your scent control, you don't have to really worry about leaving any odor on the vegetation. Something I don't understand, other people don't do. More people don't do, I should say. A lot of people I know do it, but such valuable technology, people don't take advantage of it. It blows my mind. Another tack. There's the orange tack. So you get Several white tacks that are kind of, some of them are old, but there's an orange tack 45 degrees, not quite 45, it's almost 90 degrees left of that white tack. That's the way I gotta go. That orange tack is a marker, a directional marker. 
here I've got a tack on a log. There's another tack. And we gotta come through this stuff. Now every spring when I do my postseason scouting, I always go back to my old locations and clean them up. And I also clean up the entries. So where I just went through right here, through these logs, if you notice, there's no dead branches in my path. I've thrown them all over to the side. So I can walk, jump across those logs easily without making much noise. I'm not snapping twigs. I've had some people respond on my marker video about you know putting your markers down low on the tree you can't do that when you're hunting stuff like this you'll never see that tack once the vegetation grows you got to put them up at eye height i mean they're not going to spook a deer those markers are not going to spook deer you got to be able to see them you prep stuff in postseason you better clear stuff away if you got a marker because vegetation is going to cover it up you got to kind of look at the type of vegetation it is how it's going to grow uh, some some of the like autumn olive grows fast real fast and you know branches can go two feet in a summer so you got to cut that stuff back if you if you want to use a marker and not have it covered definitely can't mark the base of trees if, unless you're hope, uh, hunting open timber if you're hunting open timber you're not killing mature bucks that's all there is to it unless you're in micromanaged areas i hate to burst people's bubbles but, <laughs> but that's just a fact they don't want to admit it. People are killing big bucks every year because they have beautiful managed private properties. Uh, they don't want to hear that. <laughs> but that, but that's just the reality. There's no hunting pressure. If I were the only quarterback in the NFL, I'd be the MVP every year. So, uh, you know, when you're the only one hunting someplace, your expectations should be extremely high because you have zero competition. And when you do anything without competition, you can't say how good you are. That's my opinion, personally. Scent control is just a big deal. You know, you watch these guys, whether it be on TV or in YouTube videos, and to me it's just an absolute joke. They'll sp spritz themselves with some form of spray of sodium bicarbonate and water and, and call it good. You gotta be kidding me. That will not make you scent free, no way. And you notice they always play the wind. They always hunt the wind. Uh, if you want to be scent free, scent free has a bunch to do with your entry and exit routes because you can go places and you're not leaving odor. You're not leaving odor on the vegetation where deer may come down the same route you're using for your entry when they come into your location. Or deer may cross your route and swing around and come into your location from the downwind side, whatever it may be. Scent control is a big deal on entries and exits. Everything matters. Even your exits matter. A lot of people, when they get done hunting, they think, well, I'm done hunting today. You know, I can make noise. I can do whatever. And they just, their lights go all over the place and they talk and while they're walking out of the woods. And there's, you know, if you don't think mature deer that you're trying to kill, don't notice that and avoid that place during daylight hours, you're sadly mistaken, uh, especially in heavily pressured areas. Uh, but scent control makes a big deal. You know, I can walk I can walk down edges of swamps. I don't like to because I'm making noise and a deer may be bedded close to the edge that I don't want to kill and spook and spook other deer going back into the swamp. But I can walk down edges even if the swamp is on the downwind side. I'm not worried about the deer winding me walking down the edge. That is not going to happen because I use scent block properly. And I use a head cover and a drop down face mask and clean rubber boots and gloves and I take care of this stuff properly. I don't have hair hanging out from underneath a cap like the TV guys that have a scent lock jacket and pant on. That doesn't work. That is not a scent control regimen. You can have a scent lock jacket and pant on if you don't have the gloves and head cover covering your hair, your beard, if you have a beard covering your neck, covering your mouth. If you don't have that, you better pay attention to the wind because you will get busted. So it, it, a scent control makes a monstrous deal. It's the biggest game changer there is in bow hunting, where you're dealing with animals up close and personal. It's the biggest deal. Yeah, saddle's a big, big deal too over a tree stand because it gives you so many more opportunities because of the things you can do out of a saddle that you can't do out of a tree stand. But scent control is the biggest game changer. There is no way over a time frame 
that a hunter, two hunters of equal skill set, if one was had a great scent control regiment where he didn't have to pay attention to the wind and the other guy didn't and he had to pay attention to the wind, over a time frame, the guy that had the scent control regiment would annihilate the guy that didn't. That's just a fact. On the same property. I have to say that. It has to be on the same property. Obviously, somebody that's hunting in Wisconsin or in Iowa or Kansas, whatever they do, they're going to be able to kill more deer than me, even though I have a phenomenal scent control regimen and they have none, because they're just hunting places where there are a lot more big bucks. Wisconsin, for instance, enters over 500 PNY bucks every year. Michigan, with 70, 80,000 more bow hunters, enters about 70 Pope and Young bucks a year. That's an eight time difference. 800% higher percentage of killing a book buck in Wisconsin than it is in Michigan. And the stats for like Iowa and Kansas and Missouri, they're 20 times higher. <laughs> so I just use this Wisconsin as an example because they're on an even plane with Michigan and they have a lot of hunters. Wisconsin has a lot of hunters, but they have a lot of big mature bucks too. But anyway, um, if you want my scent control regiment, you're more than welcome to send me an email. Just say scent control regiment. That's all you have to say. And my email address is D E E R as in deer, J O H N 51 at gmail.com. So it's deer john 51 at gmail.com. D E E R J O H N, the number 51 at gmail.com. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, it's a very important video. I know everybody likes watching the YouTube videos about climbing trees and sticks and how light they are and then how much this saddle weighs versus that saddle and how pretty this is compared to that. I'm talking about stuff that has an effect on what you actually get opportunities to kill. Sometimes I can be a real ass just trying to push my point that uh, a lot of the peripheral stuff that people pay so much attention to doesn't really mean that much in the long run of getting opportunities at deer. That's the way I feel and I'm not taking any of it back. Thank you for watching. If interested, the links to many of the podcasts I've been on or for information about my two-day whitetail workshops that take place in March and April, please visit my website at deer-john.net. Thank you for watching another episode of Eberhard Outdoors and to receive notifications for future videos, please subscribe.